Well, hello everyone. This is Amy Canust, and I'm just going to uh, advance the slide here and introduce myself a little bit. I'm a partner here at Ide Bailey, and my background is I spent about 10 years working in public accounting, primarily um, on the audit side of the practice. But for about 20 years, I've been working with ERP applications and specifically helping customers identify the right solution. I've done hundreds of implementations. I'm certified in six different ERP applications. And so it, it, it fits well into the topic that we're going to be talking about today, which is the value of cloud ERP. Today, what we'd like to accomplish in this session is we want to talk a little bit about how you determine uh, if it's the right time for you to switch business systems. So we'll talk through some of the drivers that typically uh, prompt customers to take a look at various alternatives and perhaps choose a new uh, business management system. We'll try to understand the key differences between on-premise and cloud solutions, and we'll talk about the difference between hosted and multi-tenant solutions, because oftentimes the term cloud is applied to both hosted and multi-tenant environments, and that can be a little bit of a misconception. And so we'll talk about some of the differences in economies of scale and what a, a true cloud ERP solution looks like. We'll talk about the benefits of a cloud ERP for a growing business, some of the actual tangible benefits you can realize by uh, investing in a cloud application. And we'll talk about some future trends. So we're going to do some forward looking uh, discussions here. So things that you should be looking for down the road if you are evaluating ERP systems and making sure that your solutions are capable of supporting because they're going to be transformative to the industry. We'll also talk about the, some of the keys to identifying the right solution for your needs and specifically some of the parameters that you should use as you're evaluating those solutions. And then we'll have time for Q&A at the end. So those are the goals of our presentation this morning. And I will move on uh, to talk a little bit about uh, some of those drivers that typically lead businesses to understand that they need to make a change. And one of them can be disparate systems. So it's an interesting exercise and I often challenge my clients to try to catalog the number of systems they have in their environment. And typically, if you're dealing with a legacy ERP application, it looks something like this, where you may have a separate set of databases for things like e-commerce, SFA stands for Salesforce Automation, customer support, customer service, maybe in a separate location. Accounting uh, could be handled as a disparate system, and then warehousing maybe a third-party application. So all of these things then really need to speak to each other, and that can be an exercise in cost or an exercise in, in labor to keep those systems in sync so that there's visibility across the enterprise. So this is one of the, I think, uh, key drivers that can lead people towards looking for a new system. And other examples are business processes that can constrain growth. And I think you'll see a consistent theme throughout this presentation that really when we're talking to people about ERP systems and they're looking at alternative solutions, there's really two primary factors that are driving that. One is growth and the second is change. And so all of these reasons kind of play into those two concepts. And, and business processes, when we think about those disparate systems you saw on the previous slide, those types of configurations where you have multiple databases you're trying to maintain, what that really does is constrains growth. It requires you to add additional people, typically in order to support additional transaction volume or growth in your organization. So if your, your system seems inflexible and has been constrictive to progress or automation, that might be one driver to indicate that you're having growth that outpaces the capabilities of your technology to support it. Another issue is innovation. Oftentimes we see our competitors taking advantage of new technology and perhaps strengthening relationships with customers, having more visibility up and down the supply chain. If your technology has become dated, then integrations can just become more difficult and more costly and the system's strategic advantage for your organization diminishes over time. The pace of change in technology is extremely rapid. If you think about just your hardware, that you're utilizing internally, you know, a typical turnover type of hardware is three to five years. You know, software, our goal is to uh, identify an application that not only supports the needs today, but has 
sufficient investment to support your needs 10 plus years from now. And that's a long time in the technology life cycle of applications. In addition, another driver could be the market. Uh, there's a lot of M&A in act activity right now in the software space. What we oftentimes see is very acquisition oriented um, private equity companies coming in and purchasing an ERP application for its customer base and not necessarily investing in that solution. And that's how uh, solutions lose their relevance over time. So many of you may be in a situation where your product's been discontinued or it's at an end of life where it's really only being maintained and the updates that you're getting on an annual or biannual basis are not significantly increasing your capabilities, right? It's simply in maintenance mode and uh, the company is just trying to accrue the benefits of receiving the maintenance as opposed to reinvesting in the, the growth of the solution. So a lot of times people are in that situation if they've invested in legacy technology and been on their application uh, 10 or 15 years. Another challenge we hear a lot from customers is visibility, uh, where they are unable to get access in a reasonable way to the data that they're putting in the application. These applications are very good at consuming information, processing transactions, but in terms of being able to present that to a user in a meaningful way, they oftentimes don't have very sophisticated business intelligence or analytics tools. And we'll talk about those later, but what you'll see in modern ERP applications is more integrated analytics solutions that are either out of the box or, or integrated with best of breed third party solutions um, natively. So you're going to get, I think, a, a better, view of your organization's um, health and capabilities from a, a modern ERP application. You may also find that you're continuing to invest in this antiquated hardware or old systems. You're having downtime, you're experiencing pain during your upgrade process. A lot of those things are really hard to measure in terms of a total cost of ownership. But if you're experiencing high costs associated with maintaining your existing platform, it might be time to look at a new ERP application. And finally, um, this last bullet point really talks about compliance. And this gets into the concept of change because compliance uh, with uh, legislative or regulatory authorities can be one component of change. And you can think in terms of, let's say, ASC 606 or ASC 842 um, as some regulatory drivers of change. If you're not familiar with those, those are uh, FASB pronouncements that essentially change the way that revenue needed to be recognized and lease liabilities were recorded. All of those things impact systems, right? And if our system's incapable of supporting the regulatory requirements that we have in our industry, there can be challenges. You can think CFR Part 11, uh, you can think PCI compliance, anything that's really, um, you know, driving specific functional requirements in the application that you're required to comply with from a government perspective. There may also be a change, like let's say GDPR, which is a privacy regulation for the EU governing access to data within that jurisdiction. So there's lots of things that could play into um, a, a compliance component. You could also have change though that's driven by the market. And oftentimes we'll see our clients come to us and say, I have a new opportunity to pursue a revenue stream. For example, a manufacturer that, start, that wants to start charging a fee for usage of their products as opposed to actually charging for the purchase or sale of those products. It can be a very different business model. It is something that we're seeing as a trend in the manufacturing distribution space. And yet a lot of legacy ERP applications are just not designed to support usage-based billing. So those kinds of things can drive change as well. And so if you're experiencing any of these things, it might be time to think about whether you could benefit from uh, a modern ERP platform. So some of the challenges you, you typically find with legacy uh, on-premise environments is version lock, uh, as, as an example. This really represents a legacy system that has been perhaps customized over the years, and you're in a position where the cost to upgrade outweighs the benefits because of the level of customization involved, and it would create a lot of pain and disruption in the business to upgrade that application to take advantage of new functionality. And therefore you become version lock or stuck in the current 
uh, version of the application that you're using and you're unable then to evolve with technology and, and with the application because those customization tools were not flexible enough to support that. You may have a lack of innovation on the platform. So you, you simply don't have the flexibility to do the things that you need to do in terms of automation or customization. And therefore your business processes are version locked as well, right? You don't have the flexibility to change. Uh, they may be expensive to maintain and to understand even the total cost of ownership. Also a lack of scalability. So in a traditionally RP environment where you have an on-premise system, in order to scale that up, it requires you to scale your hardware as well. So it becomes a dual investment, both in the software and in the hardware. So it, it's less flexible and less easy to grow under that, uh, those constraints. Databases are also typically disparate. It was kind of a best of breed model where you had an independent CRM system, you had your ERP application, you maybe had an e-commerce platform, and all of those were forced uh, to try to communicate with each other. And that resulted in costly integrations that were not only expensive to create, but expensive and complicated to maintain. Especially if you wanted to add fields or add functionality, it involved touching multiple integrations simultaneously with the application. And then of course, lack of real-time business intelligence. We're always relying on historical reports and then oftentimes compiling those reports into something meaningful manually outside of the application. In terms of costs, when you think about ERP costs, it's not only the maintenance that you're paying on an annual basis for that software. It can be the initial software uh, purchase price, the original implementation costs, your annual maintenance. You may also have uh, upgrades on an annual or biannual basis that are costly in terms of time, time and dollars. There's downtime typically associated with that where your business is not unable to process transactions. You may have a database administrator that is on staff doing performance tuning and maintenance to that database and application. You may also have, again, those customizations and integrations that require maintenance and support. And then typically you are responsible in that environment for all of the backups and disaster recovery. So your business continuity planning is, is essentially your responsibility. Uh, and you'll see that with modern ERP applications that are cloud-based, there are managed services that help you support that. So it's kind of like outsourcing your payroll. You're outsourcing that, that business continuity and the, uh, the managed service around it. You also, of course, are responsible for all the hardware, the database, the storage, the network, and the security around that. And so if you think about your, your server and where it might be located, a lot of people have that in a closet or you know, in the basement, somewhere in their facility. And you know, that is about the least secure location you can have for a physical server because uh, many, many people have access to that. Um, and uh, it's just, not the level of security that you will get from a modern ERP application. So in terms of the traditional on-premise uh, ERP reality, it's, it's generally up to five times more expensive to maintain per license because you have responsibility for all of those costs. In addition, about 66% of people on legacy applications would consider themselves version locked, running on old outdated versions because it's too costly or time consuming to upgrade those to the newest releases. It also drains innovation because all of your resources from an IT perspective are typically devoted to just maintaining the existing environment as opposed to uh, enhancing it or automating it or improving uh, functionality around it. It's just, it becomes a maintenance exercise. And then finally, they're fragmented, they're disconnected. So it's difficult to have full visibility. For example, a sales rep might wanna be able to see how uh, accounting transactions like invoices and payments are flowing. So when they go on site to visit a customer, they can, they can have visibility to all that. Well, in a disparate environment, that requires an integration to get visibility to what's happening in the accounting application. Um, so there's many, many examples of that, but uh, you know, typically those cause some pain for users on a daily basis as well. In a modern ERP uh, cloud platform, it, the, the model is completely different, not only from a cost perspective, but also functionally. So I think one of the, the biggest things that you can be provided made by a true cloud ERP system is economies of scale. And we're gonna talk a little bit about how uh, that is applied to cloud ERP applications on a future slide. 
Um, it also permits growth without additional infrastructure investment. Because there is a managed service around this application and the database and the infrastructure are the responsibility of the application provider, as you require more resources, either because of transaction volume or because you've ha happened to increase user counts, that infrastructure scales up with you. It also scales down with you. So if you um, are decreasing your user counts or decreasing your volume, that scales down automatically because you're in a shared infrastructure environment. So it becomes much easier to grow. It is a painless, seamless process to the user to experience growth. Um, focusing on the core competency, competency instead of managing the IT investment. Again, this is about, do we wanna be focusing our time on growing our business or do we wanna focus our time on you know, maintaining our applications? And where should we be putting those resources? How could we put them to better use if the platform was maintained in a managed service environment, right? And, and the application was automatically upgraded. So most cloud ERP systems are considered versionless as a result because every user is on the current version of the application. The upgrades are delivered to you automatically. The downtime involved in that is usually 30 minutes or less, It's typically done overnight outside of business hours, but you are always on the most current release of the application. That makes it easier for the vendor to support you. It also makes it easier for you to take advantage of new features that are available in the product. So taking away the pain of those upgrades is a huge value add for modern cloud ERP systems. They're typically also built on a unified platform. So instead of being a best of breed model, you typically have a full suite of solutions to manage a business built in the same platform. And we're gonna, we're gonna demonstrate that. Um, that results in one version of the truth. I don't get one result from my CRM system and print a sales report out of my ERP and get some completely different result. Right? They are all one solution, one database, one source of truth. They are typically also platform-based. So this is a paradigm shift from the way legacy ERP solutions are built. In a legacy platform, you're typically getting a set of functionality and then a small customization toolkit right? that may allow you to move some things around on a form, to change customer-facing and vendor-facing documents, to add some user-defined fields and to make some minor changes to the application. But fundamentally, the way the application thinks is very hard-coded in those applications. And the way business processes are performed is very hard-coded in those applications. In modern cloud systems, what you'll hear is the term integrated development environment. Essentially, the application publisher built a development environment, and then they created the ERP application in it. And they deliver both the ERP application and the development environment with the solution. Now, that may sound like a very technical situation that might be difficult for some users to support, but the reality is that they have, they have advanced to the point that they've placed a user interface or a UI over this development environment that enables or empowers power users that are not developers to make changes to business processes, to screens, forms, fields, tables, workflows, reports, dashboards, automations within the application without touching an ounce of code. So uh, again, it's, it, it's they've given you the flexibility, right, of an integrated development environment, but they have simplified it and put the power in the hands of the user in terms of how to execute on those tools. It's also typically mobile, right? So the concept is your data anywhere, anytime, any device. It is going to be entirely web-based. Any new modern ERP application is built entirely on web technologies, typically HTML5, and it supports any platform. So it's completely browser agnostic and device agnostic. It doesn't matter whether you're running an Apple, whether you're running a PC, whether you're on a phone or a tablet, there's going to be um, apps that support every device and you're gonna have visibility to your data from wherever you are, real time. Okay, now what that enables for you is collaboration with customers, vendors, and partners. And then finally, you're typically going to get an integrated data analytics product or business intelligence tool set. In a legacy environment, typically these were third-party solutions or they were best of breed models where you had to integrate with a Tableau or some other third-party product. What you'll typically find in modern ERP platforms is the business intelligence solution is 
is built into the application and is real time. So there's no synchronization of data required. Um, and typically these tools have been built specific for your industry. So they have been tailored so that they support the standard KPIs, reports, dashboards, automations that are specific to companies that are similar to yours. So those are some of the benefits of a modern ERP platform. Now, how does the cost differ between uh, traditional on-premise ERP and, and cloud ERP? Well, you'll find that because of the managed service that provides you all of the disaster recovery, the security, the maintenance, the upgrades, the hardware, the database, the performance tuning, the scalability, all of that is part of the managed service, which is in reality built into your subscription cost. So you are in effect outsourcing all of that maintenance activity that you were performing in the past. So you typically have that annual subscription fee, which is going to be higher than a maintenance cost, again, because all of these other costs are built into it. You'll have the initial implementation, and then you'll have any customizations or integrations that you choose to build with perhaps you know, internal operational applications or solutions that are pivotal, pivotal to the success of your business. So it really simplifies uh, the cost environment in addition to simplifying the infrastructure for you. So if you try to compare on-premise applications to cloud-based ERP, there is a dramatic difference in what appears to be the license cost. Because in uh, on-premise ERP, licensing may be only 26% of the overall cost of maintaining and, and um, acquiring the application. The difference, however, is beneath the surface. It's difficult to see and quantify. It's things like the infrastructure, the maintenance, the patches, the IT resources you have to have on staff, the upgrades, the training, all of that. Um, whereas with cloud ERP, 65% of that is, is licensing, which incorporates the managed service. And 35% is optimization resources like consulting, training, um, personalization of the application. So that's, that's really a discussion of on-premise versus cloud. Now, there's a lot of flavors of cloud out there, and you might hear every ERP application put cloud in their name somewhere. Um, that can be a little bit deceptive because just taking an on-premise ERP application and putting it in Azure or in an Amazon database is not really giving you the benefit of a multi-tenant environment. It's not really putting you in a versionless solution. It's not really providing you with the full managed service around the application. And the best way to think about it is a single tenancy, which is the equivalent of an on-premise solution hosted in the cloud, really means that you're still responsible for all of those resources, right? As you scale up and scale down, you still have additional costs associated with that because you are paying for your share of that server and your application is completely independent from any other user's application. So from an uh, upgrade standpoint, you're still responsible for upgrading your own application or hiring someone to do that. If you're in a true multi-tenant environment, though, it really is a shared resource environment, not just from a hardware standpoint, but from perhaps a database standpoint and an application standpoint as well. So the basic code base that everyone is operating on is the same. You do, however, have your own dedicated space for personalizations that you've done to your specific environment that are going to be independent of anyone else's customizations or personalizations. But the code base of the application itself is shared across all resources. And what, what an application vendor can do with that then is they can simply upgrade everyone at once without touching your customizations and leaving those in your own, what they call layer. So when you talk about economies of scale and the ability of vendors to pass on cost savings to the customers with this model of completely shared resources and the ability to upgrade thousands of customers at once, those cost savings can pass directly to the consumer, right? And the reality is that the marketplace has selected cloud as the model or design of choice for future applications. We're all using cloud applications today, whether it be Office 365 or something that you access through your bank uh, to pay bills. 
you're all leveraging cloud applications in your business. Google is another uh, perfect example of that. And this is a graph that really represents what is expected to be the growth of the global cloud ERP solutions market through 2023. Uh, there's no numbers on this graph, but the, the top end of 2023 is $67 billion. And what this really means is the world has seen its last newly built on-premise ERP applications. These are, are effectively obsolete and they are on the declining side of their growth curve. And ultimately, all of those will be replaced with cloud applications. And if you look at the vendors today and where they're investing their dollars, it's not in legacy ERP products. Therefore, people that are running those legacy products that are on-premise um, are not getting the benefit of new features and functionality that are available because of technology that arises today. So that's really when you're thinking about change, don't think about what you may need today. Think about how is the business going to be viable five and 10 years from now? Is there a platform I need to invest in today that I'll be able to then capitalize on over the life of my business? And a lot of factors can go into that decision. I think we're ready for a polling question. The first polling question is a true and false one. Visibility, older systems often store data in a way that takes considerable time and resource devotion to pull unconvoluted and frequently inaccurate reports. True or false? Wow, 100%. Excellent. Well, everyone got that right. So absolutely. So this was one of the drivers for change we talked about earlier um, that people typically talk about when they're thinking about looking at a new ERP platform. I'm a little bit behind here, so I'm going to move on and talk about some of the benefits of cloud ERP. So uh, once we've decided, okay, it might be time to look, what are the benefits we can realize as an organization? One of those is scalability, right? One to a thousand users can use the same system without the need to, uh, to update infrastructure. So if you're seeing significant growth in your organization and you know that's gonna be costly to invest in the infrastructure to support that growth, this might be a good time to make that change because you can both scale up and scale down. There's also modular functionality that allows you to scale out functionality. So add features as needed. And a platform approach allows for rapid deployment of company specific solutions. Here's an example of the modular nature of an ERP application today. A lot of people used to think as, of modules as accounts payable, accounts receivable, general ledger, uh, right? Some of that, and all of that really today is kind of comprised in this, this finance purchasing sales manufacturing area. But in reality, modern ERP uh, systems are now expanding beyond the horizons of simple accounting transaction processing. And they're branching into supply chain and warehouse management and e-commerce and customer client and vendor portals and HR payroll and CRM, Salesforce automation. So all of those, those functionalities are now built out of the box and you simply choose when it is appropriate for you to implement that functionality, but you're leveraging the same platform. The vision is one platform to run your business. The other benefit is it reduces risk. Um, I can't tell you how many clients have come to me and said, yeah, we have, you know, Rick's been here for 20 years. Rick's the only guy that understands this part of the application because Rick built it. Right? Your, your business, just like being entirely dependent on one customer, should never be entirely dependent on one person or one group of people because that's a high risk for you to, for business continuity. So by going to a modern ERP application and getting away from those very specialized customized solutions, uh, you can then share that knowledge cross-functionally within the organization and rely on a team of folks that can support the business going forward. It also improves your data security, your system reliability, and your uptime. So you cannot create a secure environment as these ERP vendors can. Essentially, these are using multiple layers of security from physical security to database security to network security to application security to support, to reduce that risk and to ensure that your uh, data is going to be safe and available to you. They also provide automated disaster recovery and redundancy. So 
how many of us are backing up our PCs and taking that home every night and relying on that to support uh, our business continuity. You're essentially with one of these modern ERP platforms getting a completely redundant environment where your data is simultaneously replicated into two different servers. And if anything happens geographically to one of those, or, or from a natural disaster standpoint to one of those servers, it fails over automatically to the other location. So these are, these are systems that would be very expensive for us to build either in an on-premise environment or in a hosted environment, but it's part of your managed service. 50% of small to medium-sized business companies that suffer total data loss uh, go out of business within six months. So reducing risk can be really critical. Managed service provider is also responsible for a lot of compliance with regulations as well and ensuring that the application is compliant with those so you no longer have to worry about GDPR, or PCI compliance, etc. That it's, it's the responsibility of the managed service provider. And that allows you to focus your human capital resources on your core competency and your strategic goals. In addition to that, you're going to get high availability and high performance. What does availability mean? It means accessibility, right? Your data anywhere, anytime, any device. And it also means low downtime. Many of these applications, even with their inherent upgrade processes that they'll go through twice a year, will guarantee you 99.95% uptime. And many of them are experiencing 99.99% uptime. So you don't have to worry about, is your application going to be available? You're going to be able to get to your data anywhere, anytime, any device. And you're going to have enhanced performance. So rather than worrying about the speed of your hardware and the age of your server to determine how your users are gonna interact with the application, it's really only dependent on the speed of your internet connection. It also enables visibility to business intelligence and trend transactional data in multiple geographies like languages and legislations. So many on-premise ERP systems were built for a specific geography slash legislation. They only support, let's say, US taxation. And if you tried to take them to France or to Canada, you would struggle, right, to be able to support the regulatory and legislative requirements of those jurisdictions. With modern ERP applications, not only are they built for the cloud and built for the web, but they are built for international consumption because we are an international economy today. And many people, while they've been, been doing business with, you know, uh, multiple countries in the past, they not, haven't necessarily been doing business in multiple countries in the past. We are seeing tremendous growth in that area and expansion worldwide uh, from our customers. And this is, a, this is a huge benefit of cloud ERP. They're also not dependent on any hardware specifications. So we, when we talk about that, we say no footprint is required on the workstation, meaning you do not have to install anything on your local workstation to be able to run this application. And there's no server required to support it. Completely application and browser and operating system agnostic. Now, there are some um, futuristic technologies that are being built into ERP applications. And I'm gonna spend a little time talking about these. You may not have access to these today, but these are things that you, um, you should be thinking about as you consider investing in uh, new applications. So these are digital capabilities. And some of those would include artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic process automation, uh, and another, a fourth one is blockchain. And we're gonna talk a little bit about these and how they might impact ERP applications of the future in the next few slides. So artificial intelligence, um, there are some forward-looking statements here. These are actually projections by a group called Gartner Research Corporation, and they are a kind of an industry standard in software research and analysis. If you've ever heard of Gartner, they typically put out a quadrant of applications in the ERP space, the CRM space, various, uh, various areas of business management. Uh, and they often have uh, thought leadership around some of these applications. So quote by Gartner, as of 2018 was by 2020, embedded artificial intelligence will be a differentiator in ERP applications. I wanna point out that there are already artificial intelligence applications creating predictive analytics in applications like Salesforce. If any of you are using Salesforce, there's a tool called Einstein. And what Einstein essentially does is it looks at your historical opportunities 
and it identifies the trends and the activities in those opportunities. And it looks at the ones that are, that are closed won versus closed lost, it essentially benchmarks those and creates a series of metrics. And then it applies those to current opportunities and it can make recommendations for you in terms of which opportunities are likely to close as opposed to just relying on your sales reps to tell you, here's what I think is going to close. Einstein is a little smarter than that and can actually recommend for you what is going to, to realistically occur in your organization. So that's one example of an artificial intelligence application being built into, in this case, a CRM. But some examples in ERP might be improving accrual provisions by understanding prior period actuals and predicting future results looking at underlying transaction volumes and types perhaps accelerating the financial close process, looking at dynamic discounting opportunities with suppliers and making recommendations, or even projecting future cash flows by predicting which customers may default or pay late. So there's lots of applications for this that could, could occur in ERP uh, applications. Uh, the next one is RPA, which stands for Robotic Process Automation. And the quote from Gardner is, by 2020, uh, RPA will eliminate 20% of non-value added tasks from the Office of Finance. So this is going to become a core part of our ERP applications of the future. But likely, these will not be built into legacy applications, right? They're only going to invest in these new technologies in the cloud, because that's where these technologies are enabled. And an example of some RPA in a modern ERP application might be around bank reconciliation. It's, it's time consuming, it's very manual, it's redundant. So it typically involves numerous business entities or locations and vendor payments comprising different times and payment methods. But RPA could reconcile your bank statement automatically for you. By automatically logging into multiple bank accounts, logging into the ERP system, extracting the general ledgers, utilizing something called a bot, cross-referencing the balances of the bank statements to the general ledgers and preparing the bank reconciliation statement using predefined templates. So if your bank reconciliation is painful today, uh, very shortly, you will have tools available to help support that. Now, I mentioned the word bot. Uh, I don't know if anybody's really looked into this or heard about a bot, but a bot's essentially a software program that performs repetitive tasks. So I'm going to show you an example of a bot in an ERP application. Ah, that didn't work. Go back and try that again. Got to click the right link. So this is going to open up um, a web page, and it's going to take us out to a bot named Peg. And Peg is actually um, an invention of Sage software. So this is built into a Sage ERP application, but I wanted to show you what a bot looks like. We've all probably used a chat bot uh, when you've logged onto a website and a little chat window has popped up and they've said, hey, can I help you today? Uh, you're really interacting with a bot in that scenario. They're automating a repetitive process using a software program and you're communicating with the software program through that bot. Now, this is an example of an ERP application bot, and it's actually use, utilizing text messages to record an, an invoice. It's a very simplified example. These bots are capable of doing much more sophisticated tasks than this. Uh, but essentially, all we're doing is typing in the word income to PEG, which is a, a text message contact of ours, and PEG responds back with, with questions. When we respond to those, she actually posts a transaction in the ERP application. And that's an example of a, of a bot in, in, uh, in use today in an ERP application. And then finally, the last one I want to talk about here is blockchain. Um, you may or may not have heard about blockchain. I personally think blockchain is going to be the most transformative technology, um, you know, maybe in the, in the decade, that's going to impact our businesses. So the, the comment from Gartner was by 2020, 90% of ERP vendors will enhance their offerings with blockchain inspired capabilities. There are some ex real world examples of this in use today with large retailers. Um, there is a large retailer out there that's actually requiring all of their leafy green vendors who sell them leafy green vegetables to be on their blockchain so that they can completely track the forward and backward traceability of those leafy green vegetables. So to educate you a little bit about what a blockchain is, it's a digital record of transactions. It's typically used uh, and it became most prominent in cryptocurrency and tracking transactions related to cryptocurrency. But the name essentially comes from its structure. So an individual transaction or record is called a block. 
and it's linked together in a list called a chain and that's why they call it the blockchain so the, the requirements you have to have to create a blockchain transaction is you actually have to have a transaction occur the transaction must be validated so there's a handshake between both sides of that transaction validating it it's, a, it's almost like a digital signature that you and your supplier or you and your customer are confirming that that transaction occurred independently that transaction is then stored in a block and the blocks given a unique hash code that is added to the end of that blockchain and that hash code actually incorporates the previous block in the chain a portion of that hashtag which makes these transactions immutable you really cannot change or edit a blockchain transaction as a result of the way that the hashtags are developed. So an example of this in a modern cloud ERP application, you know, might be providing visibility because these blockchain transactions are transparent and visible to the participants in the blockchain. And you could actually, as a, as a manufacturer, have visibility to what the requirements of your end customer are, allowing you to be more pro proactive in looking at demand spikes from those particular customers, inventory shortages, et cetera. You could start to do your planning based upon your customer's consumption and requirements. Also, you can reduce costs between sellers and purchasers because you're not gonna have visibility uh, to that direct customer and you're not going to necessarily need intermediaries in your transactions. Transactions can't be deleted, modified, or reversed. You may also see shorter settlement times as transactions are in real time improving uh, payment terms, removing payment terms. And then there's increased transparency up and down the supply chain. So polling question two, I'll let you take it, Allie. Great, and the question is, what is a bot? You have four choices. Um, one is a bot is a software program that operates on the internet and performs repetitive tasks. Two, a bot is a networking program. Three, a bot is a software program that operates on the telephone, or four, none of the above. And the majority of people went with, I see the first option, and is that correct, Amy? That is correct. It's a software program that performs repetitive tasks. And essentially, any repetitive tasks that you can think of in your environment can be replicated by a bot and will likely be in the future. So the next uh, learning objective we had was really to talk about how do I identify and evaluate the right solution for my needs? What is the process that I should go through? What are some things that I should be thinking about as I evaluate applications? So we like to talk about it in terms of what I call the five P's of, of software selection. Uh, those it, really just five P's because all these items start with P. The first is publisher, then platform, product, price, and partner. And all of these are important to differing or varying degrees. We'll talk about each one of those. When I think about the publisher, you, I think you wanna make sure that that publisher uh, has a significant critical mass of users on their platform. Reason being is you wanna make sure that there's sufficient revenue to support continued investment in the platform. So it's an important question to ask, how many users are currently utilizing that solution today? Also, are they a reputable organization that is prepared to support the software for the long term? Again, if you're dealing with private equity ownership, typically the purpose of that is not to invest in the solution, but rather to flip it and resell it uh, to someone else as a portfolio of solutions or to just obtain the maintenance revenue from that solution and, and uh, convert them to another application within the portfolio. So it's important to understand the publisher's business objectives with owning that application and how much they're willing to invest in it. So that's an important question to ask. And I always encourage uh, anyone that's evaluating ERP solutions to ask how many developers are currently working on the platform because that will give you a feel for the level of investment they're making in your application. Also, do they have a history of actively developing software package and making investments? Or do they have a history of simply acquiring ERP applications for their customer base? Because many, many of these companies today are simply acquisition oriented and really don't uh, invest in that technology beyond the original acquisition. So those are important things to think about when you're thinking about your publisher. In terms of the platform, you wanna make sure that it has something called open APIs. API stands for application program interfaces that allow you to connect to other applications as needed. 
are there pre-built integrations to software that might be applicable to your industry or to some very specific point solutions? Like for example, maybe expense management applications or procurement management applications, or perhaps some commercial uh, e-commerce applications like Magenta, Shopify, et cetera. Do they have those pre-built? And really what you're asking there is, you know, how sophisticated is the ISV community around this? How mature is the product? Can you enhance it? What kind of tools are available for me as a user to take ownership of this application to personalize it and grow with it to meet my needs? I think too many people focus on the functionality of the product as opposed to the platform. And the platform is really what's going to sustain the product long term, not the functionality, because you're going to outgrow the functionality someday. Right? You're going to have new requirements that aren't, aren't necessarily net, met by the solution. And if you don't have the flexibility to enhance that functionality, you're going to be very limited. Uh, and what tools are available to help manage biz, uh, the business and, and business processes? What's the data analytics uh, solution look like? And how flexible is it? How am I going to be able to extract information and report upon it? And what are the uptime guarantees of the platform? And what are the security protocols therein? So these are all important questions to ask. A lot of folks, when they're evaluating ERP, they only focus on what I'll call the, the product, which is functional requirements within the application and making sure they meet their need. And I think you need to broaden your scope a little bit to make sure that you're covering all of those five Ps and not just looking at feature functionality. Generally, if you can get a 90% fit on feature functionality and you have a platform to support the remainder, uh, you're, you probably have a pretty solid solution to meet your needs. So uh, some things to ask you around functionality though, is does it support my core functional needs? Is it built for my industry? Does it utilize best practices? Are any customers referenceable, right? For this particular product in my specific industry? Price is always a concern, uh, but I coach people that this should probably be the least important uh, of the options because you really, you're investing in a solution for 10 plus years of your organization's life. And it's more important to find the right solution. And price is somewhat negotiable as well. Um, if you can identify the solution of choice and if you can work closely with the vendor uh, that is helping you through the evaluation process, there is some flexibility on price in these ERP applications. So don't let an initial price tag scare you away. Um, find the right solution for your business, the right publisher for your business, the right platform for your business, and the right partner for your business, and then work with them on price. Because generally you'll find that as long as you're looking at a solution in the same class of products, the pricing will be comparable. And I think the most important component to think about is the partner because the software at the end of the day is just a tool. And what's really important is that you have a strong relationship with the partner that's going to put this in for you because they're going to support you for the, the life of your business with that application. And you have to make sure that culturally they're aligned to your organization and that you work well together. You also wanna make sure that they have adequate experience, right? To support your implementation, the complexity of your unique requirements. So you might wanna find out how many implementations they've completed of this specific product, right? Many of these products are fairly new in the marketplace and you may have a mature implementer, a legacy product, trying to get into a cloud ERP environment who doesn't have the expertise to deliver it. And even though they have ERP experience, they don't have any product specific experience and you're going to struggle. You will have pain in that process. Do they have any vertical specific knowledge of my industry? How well do they understand me and best practices for my business and how I can be more competitive utilizing this tool? Are they able to produce references? Ref references are an important step, but I usually suggest that you check those after you have identified your product of choice and your partner of choice. Then validate that solution with a reference check or two or three to make sure that you're comfortable with how that implementation process will work. Do they have a proven implementation methodology? A lot of partners will tell you that they do. Ask to see some of the deliverables from that methodology. Make certain that they have the artifacts around that to support a successful implementation. And then ask about what level of resources they're able to provide. How many team members will you have in your project? What are the skill sets of those specific team members? What does post-implementation support look like? And what options are available to continue your growth and optimization of the solution? So I personally feel like that's the most important choice. You know, obviously we need to look at all of the five Ps to make this, to make this decision. But ultimately, if you can find the right partner the right, and the right product to meet your needs, 
the other uh, criteria will be less important. All right, polling question three. The third polling question is, what are the five P's of cloud ERP software selection? One, publisher, platform, product, price, and partner. Two, price, product, principle, and practice. Three, platform, price, price, principle, and product. Or four, none of the above. All right, very good. The correct answer is number one. It seems to me like number one might have been the correct answer every time. Maybe that's just me, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, excellent job, and that is correct. All right, so talking a little bit about NetSuite in particular, because uh, this particular presentation is a little bit geared towards NetSuite, just to talk about how they would address those, those five Ps and some of the things that you should be thinking about as you're talking to the various solutions that you may be evaluating. So the first one we talked about is Publisher. Some of the things about a, a publisher that you might be interested to know is NetSuite is, is the number one cloud ERP. That means it has over 40,000 organizations and subsidiaries using the application globally. This gets to that critical mass factor that we talked about earlier. Ask your publisher how many organizations are using the solution you're evaluating. How many employees do you have globally? That goes to the investment in the solution, right? What revenue do you have globally? allocated to this product and how much of that is being reinvested in the solution. Where are you geographically located? Do you have boots in the ground in the countries that we are going to be implementing in? And so just, just some things that to think about and how those answers might apply uh, to, a, to a modern ERP solution. When we talk about platform, they should have uh, the ability to talk intelligently about their platform stack and all the tools that are available to you within that platform. Those things could be infrastructure related like compliance and security and uh, scalability. They may be tools related like integration platforms. In this case, this is called Suite Talk. It is an API platform. Suite Script, which is a programmable UI, part of that integrated development environment. Suite Builder, which is a tool that letting you customize the application to meet your needs, Suite Flow, which is a built-in workflow engine, Suite Bundler, which is really like an app store where you can download applications that have been built for the platform. And then they may have application layer tools as well, like the user interface being 100% browser-based, fully supported on all mobile applications and platforms, a global localization tool set, complete business analytics and reporting engine built out of the box and collaboration and social tools as well. So these are all some things that you can be thinking about when you're looking at what is in, incorporated in the platform. In addition, you should be able to find what their relevant uptime percentages are and what their certifications are in terms of security and compliance. So this is an example of page called status.netsuite.com, and it will show you the average uptime of their application. This shows you how many applications they've had, requests they've had to date, um, and it will show you the status of all of their servers. And you can tell exactly which services are currently experiencing problems or are, are uh, in full operation. So the green check marks means everything is fine with all servers across North America and the EU. And then, of course, you can see their, their security and, and uh, compliance as well and a lot of white papers there that can be downloaded. Also, you should be able to find an app store for the product that you're working on. If it is a truly uh, multi-tenant web-based application, you should be able to go out to an app store and identify all of the third-party plugins or tools that might be available to extend the functionality of that application specific to your industry. In this case, this is called sweetapp.com. You can go browse that at your leisure, but it will show you by industry, by product, by module, by role or user type, some of those uh, additional third-party uh, tools that will be available just out of the box for you to install and plug and play. In terms of the product, this graph kind of illustrates the foundation of the application, which is the unified cloud platform and the suite cloud platform, but everything in these three rings and above really is about the functionality of the application. And it incorporates not just standard receivables, payables, purchase order, sales order, but everything surrounding ERP, all of the functionality associated with financials. SRP stands for service resource planning. SCM stands for supply chain management. Omni-channel e-commerce. Uh, 
uh, CRM, customer relationship management, HCM, which is human capital management, and BFN, which is built for NetSuite. Those are the suite apps that we talked about earlier. In addition to that, the ability to expand internationally with things like multi-book, uh, multi-language, multi-currency, and multi-legislative compliance. And then on top of that layer, they also have an industry-specific verticalized solution offering for various industries where they have further personalized the application using the toolkit to fit the requirements and the needs of most businesses and in the industries that you can see listed there. So the maturity of the product should be there. And many times these cloud applications are relatively new. NetSuite happens to be around for about 15 years, but many of them uh, were born in the last five. And therefore their functional and feature set is much more limited because they were built from the ground up for the cloud and they were not able to build the entire feature set in. They intend to grow that over time. So it is important you know, to, to understand the maturity level of your application to determine how advanced the feature set is going to be. All right, and so when you do have multiple industries supported, make sure there are referenceable clients within each of those industries and specifically the industry that you are, uh, that you are currently operating in. This is just an example of some of the, uh, the well-known customers that are utilizing, in this case, NetSuite. And then finally, how do I evaluate my partner? Well, you might wanna understand how many professionals they have that are supporting the application. Um, some bars, may, you may find less than 10 people in the organization supporting the application. So you do wanna also have critical mass in terms of the professionals that are available and you want them to be dedicated to that particular application and not supporting three and four different business products. You wanna make sure they're certified and understand what their certification process is. And you wanna know that they're recognized as a leader from that publisher so that you know you're getting a reputable firm that has experience implementing your solution. And then of course you wanna define implementation methodology. All right, we wanna make sure that not only can they walk you through step-by-step step what the, uh, the process and the deliverables are at each stage, what your responsibilities are versus the implementation providers, responsibilities are, but they can also deliver you some artifacts and some documents around that to illustrate that expertise. Thank you, everyone. Um, what I'd like to do now is open it up for questions. I know we're a little bit beyond our time, but I have availability to stay on for a little bit longer if anyone had any questions. So far, I do not have any questions in the chat box or the Q&A. Okay, well, thank you, everyone. Feel free to reach out to me directly, too, if you have some questions. Yes, thank you, everyone, for attending. Take care. Bye.